Our reading for this Palm Sunday is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 12. And I'll be reading verses 12 through 19. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel, And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. It's Palm Sunday. It may feel a little odd to you, may feel like not quite Palm Sunday, uh, since usually right now during that song, the kids would be wandering around with palm branches and we would be shouting Hosanna, and maybe you did that in your home. I certainly hope so. Uh, But nevertheless, even though this is an odd situation and something we're not used to, it is in fact Palm Sunday as we celebrate the coming of Jesus into Jerusalem riding on a donkey and the beginning of Holy Week. And as such then, not only is Palm Sunday Palm Sunday, but it is also Passion Sunday. Um, As we look forward at the end of the service towards what's coming in the next week through Holy Week, through Thursday and Friday and Saturday until we get to the joy of the resurrection on Easter Sunday. So once again, thank you for watching. Thank you for being with us wherever you happen to be and whenever you happen to watch this. We are honored. We are pleased. I want to let you know uh, that there will be a Maundy Thursday drama 
a video from last year's production that will be posted this week, as well as a Good Friday service, and then, of course, a service on Easter Sunday. So we're pleased that, we're with, that you're with us, and we thank you for sharing this with others. Um, so I think that's all the... Uh, uh, the uh, community updates that we need at this time. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Messiah and Savior of the world, we welcome you into our homes or wherever we may be as we join together to praise and worship you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. By your grace, keep us among the faithful so that we may forever sing your praises in the glory of heaven, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So last week when we did the service, I felt like I was preaching into thin air. And so what I did this week, if I can reach down here, is I got one of these guys, which is a picture directory. And whereas I know not everyone is in there, at least now I know you are in fact real people, which is really helpful when I'm preaching to an empty sanctuary. Uh, So with that, I wanted to share with you that I've been a pastor for almost eight years. And one thing that I've learned just one thing, by the way, that I've learned as a pastor, uh, but it's that almost no one's life goes according to plan. You see, almost everyone has an idea of what their future might look like. And whereas some people's lives end up looking somewhat like their vision, even then there are almost always unforeseen circumstances. And I would say in addition to that, for most people, our lives just don't turn out the way that we expected. And that's not to say that it's all bad, but it is to say that life can definitely disillusion you, maybe even disappoint you. Now here's the thing, the Bible talks about God having a plan for our lives. So that is not just Drake, it's also in the Bible. And so the question I want to ask is, is it possible to ruin God's plan? Whether by our own decisions, so things that we chose, or by these unforeseen circumstances, so things that we did not choose. Can God's plan be ruined? When Jesus entered into Jerusalem on what we refer to as Palm Sunday, the people there had a plan. They had a concrete idea of what was going to happen. In fact, they thought this vision of their future was given to them by God himself. And so they're excited about this. You can see it in our reading. So they're shouting, Hosanna! And that word Hosanna was, in fact, a celebratory term. It was something used in the midst of praise and joy. And so they're shouting, Hosanna! And then they followed it up by saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! And you see, that's a quote from Psalm 118. And that psalm is all about how God is going to give his people a king and how that king is going to save them. And when that king saves them, it's going to be the most monumental, magnificent thing the Lord has ever done. And so then Jesus kind of plays into this. He gets a young donkey sits on it, rides into Jerusalem, which might not mean much to us, but to Jews who were the original congregation gathered around, they would have known the significance of this. In the book of Zechariah, in a well-known prophecy, it talks about this king that God's going to give his people. And it says precisely how he will come. Namely, he will come on the foal of a donkey. And so when Jesus rides in on the foal of a donkey, for them, the crowd that's there, there is no mistaking what's going on. And so this is their thought. This week, Jesus is going to take his throne. 
This week, he's going to rid our lives of evil. This week, everyone's going to start obeying him. It'll be the kingdom come. He's going to be our Lord and Savior, which means all of our problems will go away. Our life is about to be easy and awesome, is their thought. So what happened? And just as a fair warning, I'm going to spoil Holy Week right now. Uh, just don't let that prevent you from joining us on here the rest of the week. But here's how it went. Four days after Palm Sunday, so Thursday night, Jesus gets betrayed by one of his own followers named Judas. From there, everything unravels pretty quickly. So that night, Jesus gets shuttled between Annas and Caiaphas. They're the high priests of the temple. So that's Thursday night. By 6 a.m. Friday morning, Jesus is standing in front of the Sanhedrin. It's essentially a Jewish court system. So at 6 a.m., it is accusations from the Sanhedrin. By 8 a.m., Jesus is on trial in front of Pontius Pilate. 9 a.m., he's condemned. 10 a.m., He's stripped bare. 10.30, mocked, whipped, beaten. 11 a.m., he starts stumbling to Calvary, carrying a crossbar on his shoulders. 12 o'clock noon, he is hoisted up on that cross, at which point he begins to asphyxiate, suffer, and die. People either make fun of him or they run away. And by 3 p.m. Friday afternoon, he's dead. Can God's plan be ruined? That's the question. And in the eyes of the crowd that was shouting Hosanna on Palm Sunday and subsequently was shouting crucify him on Good Friday, it certainly seemed like God's plan could be ruined. You see, God had given them a vision of a king. And yet when Jesus came As their king, instead of sitting down on a throne, he got hoisted up on a cross. It was an absolute disaster of a week. And so a lot of them, after Christ got killed, had to have the sense. You imagine they had to have the sense. The Lord was going to make our lives good. And we messed it up. So again, is it possible for us or for someone else to ruin God's plan for our life? It certainly looks like that. And yet, I want to suggest that none of that was outside of God's plan. And more broadly speaking, that nothing at all is outside of God's plan. You can see this throughout our passage. And so what I want to do is I want to go back through the things that happened. But this time we're going to fill them out a little more. So number one, they shouted, Hosanna! And as I mentioned, that was a celebratory term. And yet in the Bible, originally it was not a celebratory term. It had a different meaning. And this isn't an uncommon thing. Sometimes the way we use a word changes over time, does it not? So for example, I remember one time, I was watching the video of the Hindenburg blimp going down. If you've seen it, it's from the 1930s. I think this happened in New Jersey. Uh, But it's a blimp going up in flames with hundreds of people on board. And so I was watching the documentary, and one of the live announcers, you can tell that he's upset by this. He's trembling in his voice, but then he says something really weird. He goes, oh my goodness, this is terrific. And I remember hearing that and thinking, what? Who would call something like that terrific? But then I started thinking about it. The word terrific is literally terror-ific. It's full of terror. We've just gotten away from the original meaning. And you see, that's exactly what had happened with Hosanna. When the crowd said, Hosanna, they were using it to celebrate. And yet yet its original meaning was solemn. Its literal translation would be something more like, save us, or help us. It wasn't so much about praise and joy as it was about desperation. Hosanna essentially meant, God, we are struggling and we need you. And so what that means is the crowd didn't know what they were saying. 
they thought they were throwing a party. (laughs) Meanwhile, God was orchestrating a prayer. It is his plan being fulfilled, not theirs. And it is he who is sovereign over this situation, not they. So next, in this passage, they said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I mentioned already, that's from Psalm 118. The problem is, they had taken that verse completely out of context. Essentially, they cherry-picked the pleasant part and left out the rest. Which isn't all that uncommon. See, even though that psalm is definitely about a king, so they got that part right, it's about a king who gets killed. And they missed that part. You may be familiar with the psalm. It's about the stone that's going to be rejected. And by being rejected, it'll become the cornerstone. And so what that means is the Savior God sends is not going to go straight to power. Instead, everyone's going to resist him. They're going to reject him. And somehow it's by their resisting and rejecting him that God's going to make him their king. And so what I'm saying is that's not what they were planning. But that is what God was planning. When they quoted Psalm 118, they thought they were embracing Jesus as their king. And yet God, what God was orchestrating was their rejection of Jesus. And he was going to use that to make Jesus their king. The last part is about Jesus riding in on a donkey. And I mentioned that's from Zechariah. Now the thing is, when a king would ride into a city, they were trying to convey to the people that they were there to take over. In fact, this is something that happens semi-regularly in the ancient world. A king would conquer a city, and then he would ride in on a war horse. And so that's what the people are envisioning when Jesus rides in. They think he's going to go to his throne and start ruling. But then instead, he goes to a cross and gets killed. And so by all appearances, Zechariah's prophecy does not come true. Which does seem to imply that we can, in fact, ruin God's plan. To which the Bible says emphatically, no, you can't. You see, we might think Christ on a cross is ruining God's plan. In reality, Christ on a cross is God's plan. You see, the cross is his throne. It is the place from which he gains real power over a person. If we're open to it, that is. He's a different kind of king. That's why he rides in on a donkey rather than a war horse. He's not going to use force to rule us. He's going to give us grace to change us. He didn't come to issue petty demands. He came to bear away sin. He didn't come to be clothed in worldly honor. He came to be covered in our shame. He didn't come to live a cushy life. He came to crush the powers of hell. He came to die our death and take away our fear. And the thing is, he wants that to be the way that his kingdom spreads. Let's be real, we have no use for another ruler with laws that don't change us. What we need is a Savior who can raise us from the dead. And so on the cross, that is what Christ is doing. And in our passage, it says that on Palm Sunday, the disciples didn't yet understand. (laughs) They just didn't get it. They didn't get what the prophecies meant. They didn't grasp what kind of king Jesus was. But then it says, if you keep reading the passage, when Jesus was glorified, they got it. And in John, Jesus getting glorified is when he is crucified. That's his glory. So it's saying when Christ was crucified, their eyes were opened. It all made sense. So they understood Psalm 118. They understood Zechariah's prophecy. And they understood God's plan. That it was not the same as theirs. And so 
everything that happened to Jesus during Holy Week, all of which looked like it was ruining God's plan, was in fact fulfilling it. On Palm Sunday, we thought it was time to celebrate, hence the hosannas. But God knew we needed to pray. We thought Jesus was a king who would go straight to a throne. God knew we needed a king who could get to our spirit. We had a plan. God's plan was greater. His thoughts are not our thoughts. and His ways are not our ways. So when I started this, I said that no one's life goes according to plan. What I meant was life doesn't always go according to our plan. But you see, it does go according to God's plan. His plan is not some small, narrow thing with little room for error. In fact, the- theologians will say that it's, quote, infinitely capacious, which is why no one really listens to theologians. <laughs> What the heck does infinitely capacious mean, right? Uh, But capacious just means it has the capacity to incorporate and use things. And so infinitely capacious means God's plan has an unlimited capacity to incorporate and use things. And that includes our failures. It includes our mistakes, our missteps in life. It includes our sins. All the evil that happens to us, all the circumstances that we neither foresaw nor wanted. God's plan is infinitely capacious. Everything fulfills His purpose, which is for us to know Him. It's for us to receive grace in and through Jesus Christ. And it's to let God write the story. So that in the end, it is a story of God's work. Because of which we never lose hope. And for which we love him beyond measure. That's a plan that we can never undo. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Infinitely capacious. That's good, because now we're going to pray. And that's going to come in handy for us, because God's plan is infinitely capacious and will include and does include all that we pray for now. So I'm going to invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious God, because of your great love for us, your beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, embrace that long and lonely journey to the cross. Gather us close to you in these days as we find ourselves alone making our own journey to the cross. Guard and guide us through these days and help us to remember that you have gone before us, suffering and dying for us and for our salvation so that we may turn to you to help and save and comfort and defend us, trusting in your forgiveness and grace and the promise of our resurrection and eternal life with you. We pray for our families, our friends, our neighbors, and all those who are without faith or hope or no church home. Help us to show them your compassion, your love, your mercy, that they may see their need for a Savior and come to know your healing and saving grace. Pour out your blessings of healing in our hospitals, our nursing homes, and private homes. Bring comfort and healing to those who are wearied and troubled by any variety of issues and illnesses and problems. We lift the names before you now of all those who are in need of your healing and your comfort and your strength. And I invite you, wherever you may happen to be as you watch this, to spend a moment bringing the names of those that you love and care for before the Lord.
Gracious God, we praise you for your goodness, mercy, and abiding care. We bless you for Christ's saving work and the glory of the cross. And now into your faithful hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusted in your mercy through your, Lord, through your Son, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. And again, wherever you may happen to be, I invite you to pray this out loud with all of us who are praying it now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against you. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive this benediction. Dear friends, our worship doesn't end as we conclude this service. It only changes form. And so as you go into the week ahead, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Savior bleed and did my sovereign die would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I was he Yeah.